started. Um, so welcome everyone to the first of our 2018 STEM Opportunities webinars for the AEOP Apprenticeship Program. Um, we're thrilled to have you here and hope that you can join us for other sessions too. We will be posting this to YouTube and sending links out via email, so you are welcome um, to be a part of it now and to reference it later um, in, in the future. So who we have with us today, I'm trying to get our mouse to work here. Of course, the one thing we didn't test is the mouse, right? There we go. So today we have um, AEOP apprentices and mentors from all of our programs. Um, the Research Engineering and Apprenticeship Program, um, which is based at universities. Um, the HSAP program, High School Apprenticeship Program, and the Science and Engineering Apprenticeship Program. We also have some undergraduates joining us who are in the Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program and College Qualified Leaders. So if you look at the maps, you are pretty much all over the country, and we even have some folks who are joining us from Puerto Rico. Um, so thank you all for coming. What we hope you get out of these webinars is, um, most, most importantly, a chance to meet um, scientists and engineers who are working across the country. Um, all of them have some connection to the U.S. Army, either they're working at Army labs or they have army funded research. And what we hope you'll discover is um, research that's underway in a variety of fields. We know that you are in apprenticeship programs at particular labs, you may be at universities, you may be at army bases, and we want to give you a chance to find out the breadth and depth of research that's going on um, so that Maybe you find that you don't want to continue in the field that your apprenticeship is in, but you're really interested to learn about another field and maybe connect with professionals in that area. We're also giving you a chance to learn how scientists and engineers find their way to their careers, um, what they did for education, maybe some past work, some of the um, opportunities that they've taken advantage of, either within the Department of Defense, um, within the US Army, or um, at universities where they studied. Um, we'll also provide you with some follow-up information about AEOP um, opportunities and also other programs that you can take advantage of within the Department of Defense. Um, and we hope in the end that you'll learn how to recognize new opportunities to learn more and find um, what's next for you um, as a student and as a professional. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Matthew Munson, and he actually is going to spend some time talking about his background, so I won't spend too much time um, explaining that, but I am going to give him remote control, and I just need to find him on the list so that you have that opportunity to use the mouse. And maybe Dr. Munson, can you ask for control? Mm, I'm not maybe. seeing you on our list. For some reason, you're not popping up. Well, I'll just uh, let you know when I want to move on to the next thing. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes here at the beginning uh, just giving some orientation to where it is that I currently work, and that's at the U.S. Army Research Office. The U.S. Army Research Office is uh, the extramural basic research uh, support agency for the U.S. Army. And what that means is primarily that we do basic and fundamental research at universities, and we, the program managers, are responsible for identifying uh, what research is cutting edge, and then encouraging proposals from uh, uh, university professors, uh, sometimes small business, uh, to be evaluated, and then we provide the financial support and the overall management of those efforts um, to try to bring the cutting edge of science and technology into uh, the Army 
science and engineering uh, research enterprise. So we technically fall under the Army Research Laboratory, which is one of the primary places where the Army does in-house basic and applied research. And then um, we currently exist underneath an umbrella organization called the Research Development and Engineering Command, which is um, encompasses ARL as well as all of what we call the RDEX, which are the Research Development Engineering Centers. Uh, so that's the, the majority of the research in the Army is done under the auspices of RDECOM. And right now, RDECOM rolls up under an organization known as the Army Material Command, which is the organization that's responsible for the logistics, um, the sustainment, the procurement, uh, anything a soldier touches, eats, wears, shoots, rides in, sits on, is ultimately provided in some way, shape, or form by the Material Command. So in order to do their jobs, soldiers need particular capabilities because um, we ask them to go do very dangerous things and we try to make sure that they have the best, most reliable, uh, most technologically advanced equipment to do so. And you can see some examples of those here on the slide uh, where I've put in kind of a next generation tilt rotor. Uh, there's a, an M1 Abrams tank um, and then some soldiers uh, on the battlefield but using a variety of different gear that's attached to their bodies um, in addition to their weapons to accomplish their mission. If you can hit the button. How do we get capabilities? Well, capabilities are effectively integrated systems of technologies. So as an example here, uh, the image on the left is um, uh, a tilt rotor test article that is going to be tested in 2020 in a wind tunnel, uh, I believe, um, at NASA Langley, uh, where the Army has uh, research partnership agreements with NASA to do these kinds of testing. Uh, so the image that's on the upper left of the tilt rotor, that's actually a kind of an artist's conception of what that vehicle might look like in the future. In order to make those things realizable, we have to actually do something to build the technologies that are integrated together into those capabilities. So if you click the next, technologies are built on our understanding of how the world works. The scientific principles that govern um, everything in the universe uh, is what we then leverage to build things that actually um, change the world. So you can see some examples there of uh, carbon bonds and the inside of a cell and um, what we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, that's a shock cell, shock cell structure out of a nozzle. Uh, so that's like a rocket engine. Um, and the, the physics of that are incredibly interesting, incredibly complicated and need to be done correctly in order for the rocket to actually move in the way that, that uh, we would want it to move to accomplish the particular objective that we've designed it for. So ARO does pushes the boundaries of scientific understanding so that technologists can begin to build technologies so that system engineers can put technologies together into an integrated capability that ultimately is put in the hands of a soldier to go accomplish the Army's mission. Go ahead. It's trying to work. There we go. So you might ask the question then, well, how does science get done? And so I found this graphic I've shamelessly stolen off the internet. Um, but you can see a number of kind of interlocked gears and there's all the kinds of things that you might expect, right? There's uh, a light bulb rep representing an idea. Uh, there's a mortar board representing education. There's a microscope presumably, you know, representing some kind of uh, research one might do. There's a computer where you might analyze your results. Uh, uh, pencil there where you know take notes and write things down. Yeah, we can talk now. Are they hearing us? I am hearing somebody at the moment. <laughs> yep, we'll try to. Um, what do you see? Why are you looking at me? I didn't do anything. <laughs> just go up and go. Yep, I'm trying to mute those folks. There we go. There we go. So those are all things that you would expect to see. Um, you know, in terms of uh, just an iconographic representation. Uh, but there's an, uh, there's an important piece of this uh, mechanism that's missing. Um, and if you advance the next, all of these things are great and all of these things are necessary, but so is this. So this is what the Army Research Office does, is that we provide um, funding from the US Army uh, to universities, to small businesses to drive this uh, innovative engine to allow science to get done. Scientists have to buy equipment, they have to eat, they have to have homes, so they have to have lights on in their labs. And so the money that the Army provides in part uh, provides all of those things so that the scientific 
uh, work can be done. Go to the next. And so primarily Aero engages the university and we try to support scientific research that will eventually uh, make breakthrough discoveries that begin to be um, the next generation of Army technologies and capabilities. So here is just an example I've shown from kind of from left to right. Uh, there's airflow over a, uh, a wing. Um, the second picture is a chemical, the, uh, is a computation of a chemical reaction that's going on that ultimately leads to something like a, a combustion flame. The picture on the right there is actually another airfoil picture uh, denoting uh, one snapshot of an unsteady mechanism and all of those things together are important for the capability that is the helicopter. So obviously there are lots of things on that chart that are missing. There's lots more to a helicopter than just those things, but all of those pictures on the left are things that came out of ARO research that ultimately enable the ability for advanced Army vehicles to be developed. So go ahead. So um, before I tell you about kind of my career path to how I got here, I'd like to take a quick moment to orient you to what is fluid dynamics. If you recall from the uh, title slide, my job is to be a program manager to go find scientific breakthroughs that lead to Army technologies and capabilities. And I do that in the area of fluid dynamics. And fluid dynamics is a term that um, I certainly didn't know in high school. Uh, so I figured I would take a quick moment to explain what the field is and then why the Army cares about it. So go ahead. So first we need to ask, well, if we've got fluid dynamics, what's a fluid? So a fluid takes on the shape of its container. That's probably obvious that it flows. Um, maybe a more technical definition would be that a fluid cannot sustain a shear stress. And a shear stress would be a motion, hopefully I'm, I can be seen on camera here. Let me see if I can see my own camera. So a shear stress is this. If you take a solid and you push on it and let go, it will spring back. If you take a fluid and you push on it, it will just continuously deform. And that deformation um, is the thing that we study. Um, in general, we say that all gases and liquids are fluids. So the same principles that might work underwater are really the same principles that would work in the air, uh, are the same principles that um, might even work in a plasma, depending on what kind of plasma it is. Let's go next. Oops. So then what do we mean by dynamics? We simply mean the motion resulting from an imbalance of forces and moments. So if we push on it or we twist it, um, it's going to move. And so uh, what we study then is the motion of fluids. Um, we study flows. We study the physics of how those things happen. And we use the equations of motion, which I've written here in the differential form. Many of you probably um, haven't taken calculus yet, um, but hopefully we'll get to do that at some point. Um, and that these are just simply a compact way to write down things that you probably have learned about in your physics class, being conservation of mass, um, that we can't create or destroy stuff, conservation of momentum that forces have to balance. And if they don't balance, it leads to an acceleration. You know, that's Newton's second law. And then conservation of energy. The amount of energy we have available to do things with is fixed, um, and it's just what form it ultimately takes. We do experiments in the lab, um, and then we also actually solve these equations on computers uh, to try to predict what flows might do. Um, so those are uh, kind of the, the basic tools, if you will, uh, that we use to do this line of work. And many of the people in my program, those that I support at universities, uh, do one or two or all three of these things as they try to answer specific questions about how specific fluids do specific things move in specific ways. Go ahead for the next. I think there's one more thing here. Yeah, there is. It's Why the Army cares. So the Army cares for a lot of reasons. The obvious one is aerodynamics. We already talked a little bit about helicopters, but there's lots of other places where fluids are important. Uh, propulsion in terms of how an engine works. There's fluids that are moving around inside the engine. Um, you can imagine biomedical uh, applications where the fluids that are moving around inside your body need to be understood, studied, predicted. Um, manufacturing, uh, you probably are all aware of uh, kind of a new emerging phenomenon over the last decade in 3D printing. And many of those materials that are, um, that are manufactured via that method um, are 
in liquid state as they are kind of squirted out onto the work platform and then you know, cured through through some you know heat or light or chemical process. So the dynamics of how those things flow inside those machines is important. Um, meteorology, how the weather works, that's all driven by uh, the movement of air and water and, and um, with energy supplied by the sun. And then uh, logistics I put on here as a, uh, a way to kind of encapsulate all of the different ways that we move fluids around. Um, I think something like 35% of all consumer products are moved by pipe. Um, and certainly when you've got something flowing through a pipe, it takes energy to push it through. And so understanding the dynamics and the energy of how to do that is an important part of uh, being able to make sure that uh, we can economically sustain those kinds of processes and on the battlefield, how we get the things to the troops that they need. So go ahead to the next. All right, so we'll talk about me for a minute. Uh, I grew up in Alaska. Um, and that always uh, makes people kind of uh, excited and surprised because Alaska is still a bit of a mysterious place. I will tell you that today, since it's the solstice, uh, you will be pleased to know that the length of today where I grew up is 19 hours and 32 minutes. So there are 19 hours and 32 minutes of daylight. It will actually not really ever truly get dark. You could go out on the porch at three o'clock in the morning and read a book, same as you could at three o'clock in the afternoon. It was a fun place to grow up. Um, I'm actually headed up there for a visit this summer. Looking forward to it. Um, but I graduated from high school um, in Alaska. I was involved in a number of things through um, a number of opportunities that were available at my high school. I took AP classes. Uh, I was in academic decathlon. Uh, I participated in student government activities and I did many other things as well. All of which was really intended. Um, I was very deliberate even as a high schooler to try to expose myself to as many opportunities and, and experiences as possible to determine effectively what it was I was gonna be when I grow up. Uh, eventually, um, I might learn the answer to that question, but for now, um, I'll tell you where I went next. Go ahead to the next, there we go. So I did my undergraduate work as well as my master's degree at Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. Uh, so that was a long way from Alaska and just, you know, who knows this, but it's actually a longer trip than that because Alaska is not really in the right place on that map. Um, but um, when I was a sophomore, I, you know, had my coursework relatively under control and I thought I might have some capacity to do something else. And so I wandered around the department for a while and eventually found a professor who was willing to uh, give me some things to do. And that started a career in fluid dynamics. So I first started my sophomore year in working in wind tunnels and I've worked in and around wind tunnels ever since. Um, the picture there that's kind of in the middle is a low speed unsteady wind tunnel where we um, can uh, put a model in place and then we can actually um, oscillate the airstream around it uh, to study the unsteady effects. And then that led us to the blue tunnel that's in the bottom right to do some work at higher speeds. And then ultimately the top right there is a one and a half stage axial compressor. It's like the beginning of um, the, uh, the jet engine. And so we were doing some work there that was supported by DARPA and NASA to understand how to make flows inside engines more efficient. Uh, my degree uh, for my bachelor's was uh, aerospace engineering and my master's degree was mechanical and aerospace engineering. They were uh, combined into a single program where my subdiscipline was fluid dynamics. We can go to the next. One of the contractors on that DARPA work was, um, and DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, if you're not familiar. It's uh, kind of a, an innovative engine within the Department of Defense to do really high risk technology development. One of the contractors on that award was Honeywell Aerospace. And so at the end of my master's degree, I was offered the opportunity to go work at Engine Systems and Accessories in South Bend, Indiana, where they build fuel controls for jet engines. And I was lucky enough to be on the JSF team, which is the new Joint Strike Fighter that's currently being built and is starting to enter operational service. And uh, the, pot, the picture there on the bottom left is actually the um, vertical short takeoff and lift version of the F-35 in which the, the engine nozzle actually rotates down to provide the pillar on which it hovers. And a lot of the technologies that I worked on while I was at Honeywell was examining how to make the motors and pumps that allow that, that rotation to actually happen. And I studied a lot of the interior flows that were associated with that um, using computational fluid dynamics, that is solving the equations of motion for fluids on a computer. 
Um, and I did that for about a year and a half and looked around and realized that everybody who had jobs that I thought were really interesting and could imagine myself doing one day, they all had PhDs. So I decided to head back to school. And the next slide took me to California where I went to the California Institute of Technology or Caltech as it's often referred. I did my PhD in aeronautics. Uh, I studied low speed flows now around airfoils to try to understand how to build small scale flyers, things that are the sides of birds. Um, and my work was supported by the Air Force. Uh, my stipend um, and my tuition were supported first by the National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship, which is one of the um, DOD's kind of flagship uh, fellowship opportunities. And that was actually supported in part by the Army Research Office, where I now work. And then um, I needed a little bit more time to finish my degree once the NDSED ran out. So I applied for and uh, was lucky enough to get the SMART Fellowship, which is the Science, Mathematics, and Research for Transformation program. And SMART is a scholarship for service. So I had a couple of years of effort um, in my PhD that they paid for. And I owed a couple of years then working for the Army Research Laboratory. Um, and so those were kind of the uh, several ways where I was engaging the DOD while I was doing um, my very basic and fundamental research. The picture there on the kind of upper left is my oil tunnel. So I moved from a wind tunnel into a tunnel who, um, whose working fluid was oil. Like I said earlier, liquids and gases obey the same rules. And so we were interested in slowing the flow down a little bit and getting the parameters just right to be able to do the investigation that we wanted to. So we built a uh, recirculating oil tunnel. And then the picture there on the bottom right, that's probably someone who maybe is familiar to you. Um, while I was at Caltech, I got the opportunity to meet Jim Parsons, who is the actor who plays Sheldon on Big Bang Theory. And he came to do a day in the life of Caltech because as you're probably aware, his character is supposed to work at Caltech, but he's actually just a drama student. So he didn't know what it was to really be a scientist. And he came to visit us and we put him in a wind tunnel and it was a fun day. Uh, so sometimes when you get to do this kind of research, you get to do some crazy, and, and silly things uh, along the way. Let's go to the next. Got my next slide, oh, there we are. Yep. So um, as I was finishing my PhD degree, I was beginning to talk with ARL because they were supporting my SMART fellowship. Uh, and I got to, um, I showed up in February and a couple of days before I had gotten there, they had just taken delivery on this wind tunnel that you see a picture of. So they gave me a nice new wind tunnel and they said, make it go. So my job for about two and a half years while I was at Aberdeen Proving Ground was to um, get this tunnel from simply a, a tube with a fan into a real research facility. And, and so leveraging all of the experience that I'd had previously, um, as well as um, a lot of expertise from people who had come before me, I was able to um, to build this up into a facility that now is capable of doing some very interesting research in the area of um, kind of low speed aerodynamic flows again towards trying to make vehicles that operate like birds or bugs. While I was there, I got the opportunity to um, apply for the position I'm now currently in. And um, I, it was a long shot. I really did it just for the opportunity to interview. Um, and it turned out that they liked me so much, they asked me to come do this job. And so now, unfortunately, I don't have a wind tunnel anymore, um, but I get to leverage the resources of the wind tunnels and other facilities all over the, the country uh, to do research, to support research that uh, hopefully will lead to capabilities in the 20, 30, 50 year time frame for the Army after next. So if you go to the next slide, this is not places I've worked now, this is places where my program supports work. And so you can see that all over the country, there are researchers uh, who are working on different parts of the puzzle to answer specific questions that I have about how flow physics works, about um, how helicopters can go faster, about how uh, missiles can be better able to hit their targets, um, how parachutes can make sure that we can drop things exactly where they want them, um, how uh, biomedical devices need to be built and designed. Uh, so I get to um, visit wind tunnels all over the country. I get to meet with very uh, clever, creative, and smart individuals, um, not just the professors, but the students as well, um, all over the country um, to support the objectives of my program and to um, try to push the boundaries of science uh, forward so that we can know some things that we didn't know before. 
Uh, so all the images you see there on the page are just little examples out of the research of um, research portfolios of those that I've supported. And I think I have just a little bit of advice here at the end of the slideshow. You do. So these are things that various uh, people in my life have said to me over the years. And rather than give the advice directly on the slide, I figured I would give the quote and then tell the story. So in eighth grade, I took algebra and my algebra teacher said, in order to think great thoughts, you're going to have to learn algebra. And we all thought she was really silly at the time, but it turns out that it's really true, um, not just algebra, but in order to think great thoughts, you have to have the capacity and the framework um, to think. And so you have to expose yourself to lots, and diff lots of different um, subjects and lots of different material in order to be able to make those creative leaps from one area to the next um, to advance knowledge and to think great thoughts. But that takes some hard work, and so you'll get out of it what you put into it. I think my biology teacher said this probably twice a day, every day of my sophomore year, and it's really true. It, uh, when you decide that something is important and you put some effort into it, you will reap the rewards. If you dismiss something and you don't think it's important, um, you probably won't get much out of it. It's not to say that it's exactly one-to-one, -one because sometimes you can get out of something more than what you put into it. Um, sometimes those things uh, multiply rather than add. Uh, but the point is that it's not, um, my whole career was not really, I mean, I was fortunate in many ways, but it was based on a lot of hard work. Let's go to the next. Of course, calculus makes things easier. So you can think great thoughts with algebra, um, but I'll just give this little example. So when I took physics my senior year, um, it was a not a calculus-based physics class. And I was watching the teacher go through these laborious derivations of the equations of motion of, of a particular system. And I raised my hand and I said, why don't you just take a derivative? And he glared at me and said, of course, calculus makes things easier. And then he told me I had to leave his class. Um, so um, I would say that whether you're an engineer, whether you're a scientist, whether you're an English major, um, you should take calculus. You should learn the way the world works and, and the way the world is described because that will begin to change the way you think about how the world works, how the world is described, um, and be able to um, make your contribution uh, to understanding things that people don't currently understand. To the next. So when I got the job my sophomore year in college, working in the wind tunnel, my advisor said, make sure you're always kind to my assistant and respectful to the machinists. If you're not, your life will be miserable and then I'll have to fire you. And what he meant by that was, it takes more than just really clever scientists and engineers to get science and engineering done. There are lots of people along the way who are critically important to supporting you, to making the things work that need to work. And um, if you walk through life treating people like they're beneath you because you're the important scientist and they're just the lowly secretary, you really won't get very far. And his point was they made his life so easy that if I irritated them, uh, he just didn't want to have to deal with me. <laughs> he was going to let me go. So just as you move through your careers, realize that there are lots of different things that need to be done behind the scenes to make your efforts happen. Um, and all of those people are important and all of those people uh, need to be respected because ultimately, if you don't, they can make your life really miserable. <laughs> go ahead to the next. And then in a conversation I was having with my uh, PhD thesis advisor one day, he said, this book, which at the time was von Karman's Aerodynamics, and it's a good book and you should pick it up if you want to know about aerodynamics. Um, he said, should be like your Bible, study it, know it, preach it. And what he meant was learn your craft, learn your trade. Whatever it is that you decide to pursue, um, make sure that you find those particular references that are kind of the most critical and make sure that those things are by your side, at your hand until you feel like you could teach that class without having to refer to the notes. Um, it's really important as you, in, you know, start on your academic pursuits um, to really go deep in the thing that you've chosen, at least for the amount of time that it takes you to satisfy your curiosity and interest. Um, uh, it's, it's not, you don't do anyone any favors um, if you only skim the surface of the things that you claim to know about. You should really um, do yourself the favor of learning the things that you care about deeply. And to the next, I think we're almost done here. 
Always keep the big picture in mind. Let people who aren't as smart as you fill in the details. Um, this was a little bit of a tongue in cheek uh, <coughs> statement from uh, one of my thesis, uh, thesis committee members. But what he meant was it's very easy in these kinds of pursuits to get bogged down in the details and to want to figure out every little nuance and to make sure that you know things down to a half percent accuracy. And, and sometimes those things just don't help you actually figure the thing out. They don't help you tell the story. They don't help you make the advance. And so make sure that you always kind of step back from time to time in your work, keep the big picture in mind. And then it's not so much that there are, you know, dumb people out there who are just turning the crank, but more that, you use your creative talents to the best of your ability and let other people who have other talent come in and fill in the rest of the picture. Science is really um, a collaborative effort most of the time. And even if you're working by yourself, um, know that there are going to be people who come behind you who will use your work um, to make the next step for themselves. So keep that big picture in mind. And then this is a silly saying that I, a professor of mine who I got very close to in college always said, he said, these things are well known to those who know them well. And it was always frustrating to me because, of course, things are well known to those who know them well. But what he was saying when he was teaching the course was that there becomes a time when you know things well. And so then you know them well and you can use them to do amazing things. And there's also a time where you don't know things well. And that's the time where you need to devote yourself to learning and to studying and to figuring things out. And so this was really more of a kind of a right place, right time quote. Uh, really just illustrating that when you feel like you know something well, well, then you probably do, and it's now time to go learn something else. Um, so with that, I think I'm done, and I'd be happy to take any questions at this point. Sure. We're, as, as people um, are typing out the questions, uh, I have a few just to get us kicked off here. Um, and one question we have um, some apprentices who are based at universities. We have some um, uh, apprentices who are based at um, Army Research Labs. And so one question that I have is how, when you were working at ARL, when you first finished your PhD, how were projects assigned to you? You know, in a university setting, typically researchers pick the projects, gather some data, write a grant, hope it's funded, um, and then move forward with the work. Um, so how does that work when you are within ARL? So um, I would imagine that there's some spectrum of ways that this works, but my experience was that, um, you know, I showed up and they knew a lot about me because we had had this relationship through the SMART program. So when they decided that they were going to make an investment uh, in the wind tunnel and they knew that I had a lot of experience uh, working in and setting up uh, facilities, they gave me the kind of a almost, I wouldn't say a blank check, but they gave me the responsibility and the authority to turn that facility into a real research um, capability. And so I would sit down, I had a team lead who I talked to probably, you know, on a daily to weekly basis. I had a division chief who I talked to on a weekly to monthly basis to set priorities, to figure out how the budget was going to work. But they really gave me a lot of free reign to both develop the infrastructure to do the measurements, but also the research program um, for what measurements were we gonna do in the first place, what we were gonna study, so what did we need to measure? Uh, so in my particular case, because the PhD is effectively a license to learn um, and gives you some kind of ex expert credibility, when I came in, I had a lot of freedom to do the things that I thought were the right things to do, obviously in concert with the priorities that my chief and my team lead were setting. Um, but, you know, day-to-day -day tasks, again, at the PhD level, day-to-day -day tasks were largely my own. I often would make a plan and then I would seek, I wouldn't even say approval, more like blessing, um, to make sure that other smart people were looking at it and making sure I hadn't missed details. But um, the majority of the details were left up to me. Great, great. Um, so we're getting lots and lots of questions. Um, so the first one was how did you choose fluid dynamics and what um, what got into, I'm trying to find that question. Um, so how did you know you wanted to do aerospace mechanical engineering? Had you always been interested in the field or was there a specific moment or story that helped you decide? So um, that's, a, that's a funny question. So I was either going to be a, a geneticist or a pastor 
And then I decided that engineering sounded a lot more interesting. And, um, you know, I, I thought a lot about the, um, the Challenger explosion. That happened when I was um, seven. And it's something that kind of always had been on my mind. And as I learned more about it through, uh, through high school, I realized that much of what happened in that particular disaster, you know, could have been prevented. Um, there was very little about the Challenger disaster that was because of an unknown. It was really because of um, political pressure and um, some shoddy engineering. And so I thought to myself, surely that kind of thing is preventable. Uh, and I started to get interested in, in actually space science at the time. And that's what drove me initially into uh, the aerospace and mechanical engineering field. Once I got to IIT, uh, I discovered fluid dynamics and um, thought it was fairly interesting. Um, but really, honestly, it had a lot to do with the fact that I wanted something to do, and that was the research experience that I ended up getting exposed to. I wandered the halls and I asked who's willing to take on an undergrad, and Dave Williams was kind enough to give me a shot, and uh, you know, kind of the rest is history. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had lots of other interests over the time. Um, I've done quite a bit in controls engineering as well, uh, but fluids became um, just endlessly fascinating to me, and I was willing to stick with it, and here I am helping to define what the, the future of that field looks like. That's great. So e literally knocking on doors, right? Knocking on doors, knocking saying, on hey, doors. I, I was careful not to say I was bored because I was afraid that I might get more homework. <laughs> um, so I said I was interested in finding out about their research and seeing if there might be opportunities for me to see how a lab worked and, and what graduate school might be like. Because by the time I was a sophomore in college, I had a fairly good indicator. Uh, that I was interested in the subject and was probably going to go to graduate school, but I wanted to know, get a flavor of what that might be. Did I want a job or did I want to spend more time in school? Great. Clearly, I chose to spend more time in school. Right, right. Um, we do, the next question is about SMART, but let's hold that maybe for um, toward the end. Um, okay. There are two questions that are asking about failure and adversity. Did you face any adversity or challenges that made you want to quit? And how would you recommend people deal with failure? Yeah, so high school was pretty easy for me. Um, I didn't, I worked hard, uh, but I didn't work that hard. Um, I had plenty of free time to pursue extracurricular activities. I had lots of friends. I lived in an amazing place that had many outdoor opportunities. So um, while I made sure that I studied well and I did the things I was supposed to do, um, I was by no means, um, my bandwidth was not totally consumed. When I got to college, it was a very different mentality. It was a very different world. There were lots of people who were like me and so kind of uh, needed to reestablish myself and learn the next level of work. And I failed miserably my very first chemistry exam. And I called my mom and I said, this is not the right place for me. I'm going to come home. And she said, I don't think that's a good idea. You probably should go ask the professor uh, what your next step is. And I did. And he told me and I did it. And I got an A in the class. Um, so that wasn't like a huge failure. It wasn't like, I'm not even going to call that, a, I won't even call that adversity because there's real adversity in the world. But, but, you know, that was one of the things that shocked me when I first got there. I thought it was going to be the same level of effort and it wasn't. And at each point then through the rest of my career and I've, as I've stepped into new things, I've had to think about that particular experience and say the level of effort at the last thing probably wasn't a good indicator for the level of effort at the next thing and to be aware that there are going to be those surprises. There are going to be those places that you weren't prepared for. And really, I think what's important is how well you dust yourself off after getting knocked down the first time. Mm -hmm. Right. And having been a non-chemist STEM student myself, chemistry is a killer. It really is. Well, you know, what was funny was I, I vowed at that point that I, <laughs> I was not going to take any more chemistry than I absolutely had to. And then I ended up taking another chemistry class the next year. So, um, and it wasn't required. It was just something I was interested in. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's, there's always those things where sometimes the struggle uh, opens up your eyes to possibilities that you didn't realize were there. Like, hey, this, this was hard for a reason. It's because it's really interesting and there's a challenge to be explored here. Right, right. We have some very specific questions about, um, computer modeling and 3D modeling. So I may save that toward the end for people who have very specific questions about your background and sure. the technical aspects. Maybe we'll just stick with some of the um, broader questions. Like, 
can you share some of the roles that is available in ARO and other related facilities for PhDs in engineering? And I had to add on to that, could you also maybe explain for non-PhD engineers, because there are a lot of engineers who don't go the sure. PhD path. Yeah, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about my the research experience at ARL first, and then I'll talk a little bit about ARO, because um, ARO is kind of an, a, a niche place. So at ARL, um, they have opportunities for those who are kind of fresh out bachelors. Uh, they have opportunities for those who have master's degrees, and they have opportunities for those that have PhDs. Um, typically, if you're going to enter the lab straight after college, uh, you'll come in at what they call a DB2, which is, uh, so we have a, a series of pay bands, and I won't get into the details, but basically there's three levels. There's two, three, and four. And when you come in as, an, as a two, you're kind of expected to be at that level, the, the bachelor's, the post-bachelor's level, where you've got some knowledge, you've got some experience, you've got the ability to understand a problem, um, and work together in a team to solve a problem. Um, as you do that for a variety of projects, eventually you will accumulate the experience that allows you to move to the three. And threes are where the PhDs typically start when they're just a fresh out three. And those are people who are largely kind of day-to-day -day responsible for their own research. Uh, they're responsible for their own tasks, but they probably work together in a team or a group. Um, but where the direction is probably not going to be daily, right? You're going to be trusted uh, to go and do those things um, and then come back with the results and, and work with your team to, to move uh, the project forward. Um, when you get to the four, and that's a fairly substantial promotion, uh, that's kind of like getting to a tenured professor level at a university, although not exactly the same thing. A four really means at that point, you're not doing the day-to-day -day work as much as you are doing kind of the high-level thinking and directing other groups of people um, to go tackle, you do this problem here, you do this problem here, you do this problem here, when we get them all, we'll put them together and we're actually gonna make them a significant advance at that point. So when you come in as a, wherever you come in, in that, on that spectrum, there are opportunities that will hopefully both match your skill level and your knowledge level as well as give you the opportunities to stretch to grow and to advance um, once you have the experience that uh, is required to, to do the kind of the next level of work and when I say at the four that you're directing people I don't really mean in a supervisory sense it's not like you're the boss but you are like the research lead you're like the professor over the research group who is kind of having the big ideas and then bringing along the team members who can help do the nitty gritty of making those big ideas actually come to life. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a great question that um, tacks on to what you just talked about. Um, have you ever published anything that you studied? So are you able to, you know, university settings, people are publishing very frequently. What about when you are at a facility like ARO or ARL? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, in fact, for the, the research engineers, who are the people kind of in the lab doing the research, um, publication is a big deal. That's actually part of how you establish that you are eligible for those kind of promotional milestones, that you are doing work that is considered by your peers to be important, uh, that you are contributing to the creation of knowledge, uh, that you are um, either the creation of knowledge or the creation of technology, right? So one route would be to do scientific research and publish. Um, one route might be to, to patent things that you've invented. Um, all of those things are that you might consider doing in a, in a university um, are possible in the laboratory setting as well. Now the caveat to that is that sometimes when you get into technology, which is different than science, sometimes that technology can really be important, an important advantage to defeating our adversaries. And so then you might run into a situation where you're working on a project uh, where you can't talk about it. It's classified or it's confidential. And so then of course you can't publish because you're not gonna put that information out in the open. But there are ways to publish that information internally so that other research engineers at ARL and other government facilities can still get that knowledge. And in fact, there are conferences that are classified conferences uh, where you can publish papers sometimes. And so even if you find yourself working on a sensitive project, there are still opportunities to engage in that same kind of behavior where you're writing down your results, you're talking about why they're important, and you're dreaming what 
they're good for, right? What's the next thing after I do this? Um, that allow you to make those advances and push the science and the technology forward. Right, and someone just asked, how does intellectual property work with doing research for the Army? So um, in general, just the long and short of it is that anything that, anything I do, uh, the government owns. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually, so that's one of the things working for the government that um, you have to think about if you're a really clever, innovative, technological person, uh, we'd love to have you, but the caveat is that um, generally speaking, the government is going to um, try to capitalize on that IP. And even if I did something in my garage tonight off the clock, it's highly likely that the government would at least have some claim to it because my knowledge and expertise is the result of my, largely the result of my government job, right? And so many of the things that I would think of doing are the things I would think of doing whether I was in the lab or out of the lab. And so that's one of the things that you have to think about um, if you, you know, if you want to engage in something like this. Right. Um, are there any other fields of engineering or STEM research that you would like to learn more about or work with in the future? So that's one of the really exciting things about working at ARO. And I'll, I'll, I'll actually address the question that was asked earlier, right? So I talked a lot about, a little bit about ARL. ARO is kind of an interesting place because we don't really have very many people here. There's only about 65 government employees here at ARO, 40 of which are these people like myself, the PhD program managers, who are out there trying to find important questions that need to be asked to drive Army technology forward, scientific understanding that leads to Army technology forward. Um, so they're just, this isn't the same kind of place as the lab. There's not research that's actively done here. I work in an office building. There, there's, there's no research facility um, here in the building. Um, but the really exciting thing is that because I work with other very clever people who are trying to drive science forward in their respective areas, and these are the people I eat lunch with and um, you know, walk down the stairs with on the way out the door, we often end up talking about the things that we're excited about in our field. and We find opportunities to work on the seams between fields. So right now I'm running uh, programs with uh, projects with people in mathematics, with people in controls engineering, um, I just literally today signed the paperwork to start a new grant with someone who works in geosciences um, where they their field has interest that overlaps with my interests. And so we're going to, from each of our programs, both support an individual researcher to do that work. Mm -hmm. um, so there are lots of opportunities for me to explore other areas of science and engineering that are not what I did in my uh, education, um, simply because sometimes in order to make the next advance, it's not gonna be in the middle of fluid dynamics. It's gonna be on the boundaries between fluid dynamics and biology, or it's gonna be on the boundaries between fluid dynamics and um, quantum physics. I mean, the, the opportunities are, are endless, um, both to learn and to grow and to uh, find other people who wanna learn about fluid dynamics. Yeah. Um, so the next two questions are, we have lots and lots of questions. We thought this was going to be a, um, a compact webinar, but if people want to hang in there, we can keep asking questions. Yep. Um, these two questions talk about transitions. So do people work for AR, ARO for a long time and then ev eventually transfer? Um, do they come and go, basically? And also, how and why did you make the transition from doing research to working at ARO? Sure. So the, the answer to the first question is, you know, it really depends. Um, if you're familiar with the National Science Foundation, they typically have program managers, much like us, um, who rotate in for a period of time. So they typically work for three years and then they go back to their normal job. Um, ARO is a little different. So I'm a full-time government employee. I could be here for the rest of my career if that's what I chose to do. And if I continue to do well and they'll have me. Um, so there are people who have been here for 20, 30 years. And sometimes science can be a 20 to 30 year endeavor where it really needs somebody staying on the rudder that whole time to make sure that the ship turns in the direction that it needs to. Um, but then there are other people who come here for three or four or five years. Uh, they either decide that they um, hate the paperwork and want to go do something else, or they just have you know, satisfied their curiosity in a particular way and another opportunity comes along and they, and they jump to it. Um, so, you know, there are uh, a number of uh, open spots that we have right now. Um, and then there are a number of spots where they've been held for a long time. 
Um, and it just really depends on the particular scientific endeavor and the personality who's in that, that chair. Um, with regards to why I made the jump, so, um, you know, you're probably aware that many scientists and engineers are not necessarily always good people people. Um, not all of us have skills that, there's a reason we like to sit in a dark lab, maybe not a dark lab, but a basement lab. I mean, I spent six years of my PhD in a basement. Um, you know, just doing the thing because we're really, really curious about it and, and um, the people stuff isn't so important. But I've always been someone who really values um, the, the relational aspect of how science is done. And when I was at the laboratory, I had a colleague who um, thought that I would be good at this job and recommended that I apply for it. And at the time, I wasn't really terribly interested because I had this shiny new toy, the wind tunnel, that I was playing with and it was almost ready to go. And then he wrote my resume for me and threatened to submit it. Um, and it was a clearly completely made up resume. Um, and I didn't want that to be what was on the record. So I went ahead and put my resume in, figuring that at least I'd get the interview opportunity out of it. And then when I came down in here and visited and, and, and did the reverse part of the interview, right, where I learned about the organization, I realized that this was a real opportunity um, to get out in front of the science and to be the one who, uh, be part of the machine that imagines what could be next, uh, that looks for new ideas that are waiting to be born, and then to be a part of, of seeing those things happen. Um, and so I personally find this to be a very fulfilling and very rewarding uh, job. I really enjoy getting to travel, getting to meet new people, getting to hear new ideas, getting to hear the crazy ideas that nobody um, has thought of yet, and then seeing like, well, you know, 90% of that is, is probably not gonna work, but there's a 10% nugget in there that's really interesting. What if we did, took it and we did that? And then they go, oh, that's amazing. Let's go do that. That's, it's just right now that's really fun. And I think it's actually more fun than running a wind tunnel. That's just me, though. <laughs> but that's you get just... to see the big picture, right? You get to see everything that's going on. Well, and not only do I get to see the big picture, but I get to be one of the painters. And that's yeah. a lot of fun. That's a great way of putting it. So um, let's wrap up with these last few questions that I have here. Um, are there any skills that are worth learning at a young age that are apl applicable to many engineering fields? If so, when and why were you pushed to learn those particular skills and how did they help you in your career? So I will tell you, I'll answer that question with what I didn't do and what I wish I'd done. Um, I was a reasonable coder, but I am not as skillful with writing code as I should be or want to be or think I would really need to be if I was back in the research uh, world. I had a friend in college who frequently said, oh, I'll just get a computer scientist to write that code for me. Um, but as an engineer in today's world, you really have to have some, I wouldn't even say basic, I think you need to have some intermediate to advanced skills, at least in one or two languages. Um, I really wish I could do more um, with writing code. Uh, the second is that just honestly, it doesn't matter what your field is. I, again, I might even say that even if your field is English, uh, take as much math as you can. Just take math. Take math that doesn't even use numbers anymore. Just take as much math as you can get because what you're going to find is that the majority of, of pure scientific endeavor uh, uses math as the language to communicate. And if you don't have those tools, you will always feel at a, dis at a disadvantage um, I have done a lot of work over the last five years or so, even past my PhD, becoming more math literate because I get frustrated when I open a new scientific journal in a new area and I can't understand what they're talking about. But if I knew more math, I would. So those would be my two recommendations. Take as much math as you possibly can stomach and learn to code. Well, you know, this is great. This is a keys into Melissa's question that um, I've sort of pinned toward, for the, toward the end. but. Could you explain how you went about developing your computer models and simulating using math and physics? Did you use equations you already knew to make virtual 3D models? Um, yes. Yeah, so the, the business of solving fluid flows on computers is, is you know, something that's been around really since computers were invented. Um, in fact, uh, before computers were invented, uh, I know I have met people from my time at Caltech, I have met you know, the, the, the human computers, the, the students who were handed a difficult integration problem by their uh, professor, and they literally cranked out all of the math by hand to get what today is an, an answer we push a button for, um, because that number was the, the input to the next part of the problem. Um, so 
solving those equations is a, a science and an art unto itself. And it's one that I don't have a whole lot of experience doing from the standpoint of developing those capabilities. I have used some capabilities that other people have, uh, have developed when I was at Honeywell. Um, we used a product called Fluent, uh, which is now owned by a company called Ansys. Um, and it's one of the kind of the standard packaged industrial codes for solving um, fluid flows on, the, on a computer. Um, but, you know, the majority of my effort has been in wind tunnel testing and experimental work. Um, so I don't really have a whole lot of experience um, actually doing the nuts and bolts of sitting down with a set of equations and then figuring out the best way to solve them on a computer. But what I would recommend if you're interested in that, uh, a guy named John Anderson uh, has a CFD book. CFD stands for Computational Fluid Dynamics. Um, and uh, I've talked to a couple of the people that I fund and said, hey, what do you think a good introductory kind of undergraduate level CFD book would be? And they've all recommended that John Anderson's book is the place to start. So if you're curious about it, um, that's one to pick up. If you haven't studied fluid mechanics at all uh, before that, that might be a rough start. Um, and I would recommend in that case that you probably pick up um, uh, my, one of my favorites is a book by Frank White uh, called Viscous Flows. And that's a pretty decent introductory text at the undergraduate level uh, to what fluid mechanics is all about. Great. Um, so second to last question has to do about managing time and work-life balance, right? Um, so we have one question about how did you manage your time as an undergrad? And also what is your work-life balance now? Do you travel a lot? Um, how, how do you manage all of this? Um, so I, uh, hang on just a second, be out in a minute. Yeah. Um, so as an undergrad, um, I thought I was busy. Um, I didn't really know what busy was. Um, I had, I always tried to do the two following things and I was not always successful, but I found these to be really useful. The first was that in, under, in your undergraduate education, almost without fail, you will be provided with a syllabus at the beginning of the semester. And often the syllabus will tell you specifically what chapters of the textbook are going to be covered in the lecture on week four. Read them ahead of time. If you can get in a pattern where you read ahead of time, then even if you don't understand it, at least the lecture is not the first time you've ever seen it. So now if you have a question, you can ask an intelligent question when you have the expert standing in front of you. Then your note taking is going to be much more effective because you're not trying to figure out what that symbol means, you've already seen it before. And then by the time you sit down to do the homework, this is now the third time you're seeing the information and it's starting to become familiar and your homework will be amazingly easier. So that was a practice I got into my sophomore year of college and I, uh, junior year got a little crazy and I wasn't able to do it all the time for every class, but for the hardest classes, I found that to be indispensable. Read ahead of time. And then the other thing was, I know sometimes it can be hard, um, but start the homework before the night before it's due, right? And in fact, the best time to do it, if your schedule permits, is right after the lecture where it was assigned, because the information is most fresh in your head at that point. So if you can take a, a, even a look at the homework and make some notes for yourself about strategies or page numbers or hey he did this in the notes it's on page six of my notes then when you actually do sit down to spend the focused time you've already oriented yourself a little bit to the things that you know will be easy and the things that you know you'll need help on um, and then that's the point at which you can engage your classmates or your professors or your TAs or whatever um, so I was very diligent in my approach to studying um, which meant that I had a lot of free time. I did all kinds of fun things. I went to school in the middle of Chicago. I was almost never on campus for fun. I was always, you know, at a jazz club, at a coffee house, um, finding, uh, you know, walking along the lake shore. Uh, I had all kinds of other interests beyond school, but a lot of it was enabled by being studious when it was time to study. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this job is like drinking from a fire hose because I'm a walking checkbook, so everybody wants my money. Um, so my inbox is incredible. Um, and I just do my best to make sure that I answer the most important things first, and the next important things next, and the least important things, eh, they'll get back to me if it was important. Um, 
I, I do travel a lot, um, but my wife and I uh, managed to balance that fairly well with the other needs of the household. And um, I generally at this point in my career, even though it probably would make my inbox management better, I work very diligently not to take my homework with me at the end of the day. It's really important for me to have a break. That's not to say I might not read a journal paper sitting on the couch, um, but I'm not taking the nuts and bolts, the day to day, the moving the money around, the dealing with what my boss wanted today and answer on this thing. I don't take that stuff home. It's really important to establish that separation for yourself wherever you are, because for this, I love this job. This is a lot of fun. I could do it 24 hours a day, but then I wouldn't be a very nice person. So, you know, everything in moderation. Right, right. That's great advice for everybody, right? Even the mentors who are on the call today. Um, so one last question, because it ties into something that I'm going to talk about in the next slide, and then we'll let you go because we know we're a little bit over time now. Um, and that is, can you explain a little bit more about the SMART program? Sure. So um, the SMART is kind of an interesting beast. Um, it was originally developed uh, because there was the recognition that I think it was in 2007, maybe it was the first year, 2006, 2007 timeframe. And at that point, it was recognized that almost 50% of the federal STEM workforce was eligible for retirement. And so if they all decided to retire at the same time, there was going to be a huge brain drain in the federal government's ability to conduct and manage scientific and engineering efforts. And so the SMART, it's called a scholarship. Sometimes it's referred to as a fellowship. But just to be honest, it's a workforce development program. Um, it is intended to pay for your education and then have you come work for the DOD for a time with the hope that you will find a place within the DOD that satisfies your intellectual curiosity and allows you to live the life you want, um, but in the service of your nation. Um, so it's, um, it's a little bit of a dicey thing. You know, it can feel like a dicey thing when you apply for it because there's a job on the other end of it. And that job is a commitment. And if you don't honor that commitment, they come get you for all the money they gave you. So it can feel a little bit, I mean, honestly, for me at the time that I got it, um, my wife and I uh, were expecting our first child. Um, we weren't sure that moving to Maryland was going to be the right move for us, but it's what I needed to do to get the, the degree done. And it turned out to be a really great opportunity for me. Um, but I would say that if you are um, interested in the kinds of things that the DOD participates in, and the DOD actually participates in a lot more than you probably think, um, the SMART scholarship might not be a bad move for you. Um, and it also is one of the uh, interesting vehicles that supports not just graduate research, but actually can, un, you know, can support an undergraduate degree as well. Um, and honestly, depending on the job market on any given day, um, having a guaranteed job when you're coming out of school, often with a security clearance, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. Uh, working for the DOD has had its ups and downs. It is a large bureaucracy, but so is Boeing or Lockheed or Raytheon or IBM or Apple, or you know, they all have their pluses and minuses. Um, and so I have found it to be a rewarding place to work. I have found uh, that I have many skilled and talented coworkers. Um, who care passionately about the future of the country and want to be involved in in that endeavor. Um, and, uh, you know, it was the right vehicle at the right time for me to finish my education. Um, so I would say that if you're considering the SMART or if you're in the middle of the SMART program right now, um, ask a lot of questions. Make sure that you know what's expected of you and make sure that you know how it might impact you, how a particular decision might impact you and your future. Because I mean, I'll tell you what, if you decide that you're in the job two years in and you've got a four year commitment and you just decide eh, I'm done, they're going to come get you for the money. And that can have a big impact on your ability to do the things you want to do in life. So um, it is a commitment. It's a serious one, but it's also one that can enable um, large possibilities. Great, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Munson. Um, this has been a wonderful hour to hear about your background, your experiences, and clearly your dedication um, to the work that you're doing and all of the researchers who you support across the country. So thank you so much. And um, I know you have to go. So if you need to hop off, feel free to hop off. I just have a couple more slides for our apprentices and mentors. Um, 
as Dr. Munson was saying, um, there are lots of opportunities and actually watch your email because we're going to send you a message um, in the next couple of days with um, a careers handout. Actually, you've got those in your welcome packets as well. And we'll also send you links to the DOD STEM websites and the AEOP websites where you can find out more information about programs like the SMART program. Um, and we also have another page um, that is on a um, sister program to the apprenticeship programs um, that outlines all of this too. We'll also um, send you the link to the webinar recording for this and for future ones. So as long as you're on the list, um, you'll get all, these, all this information and all of the links to the other recordings, um, which is what comes next. Um, we're going to have at least three more um, webinars. We've gotten some interest from some more speakers, so we may actually add to the schedule. And um, I know for some apprentices, um, you've been asked to attend at least one webinar, um, but we encourage all of you to attend as many as you'd like. This is for you. It's a resource for you. In fact, we've added and expanded um, the number of people who can join a call. Um, so please feel free to, to hop on when you have a chance. Um, next week on Wednesday, we're going to talk to Dr. Catherine Guy, who is a chemical engineer, is actually doing some really interesting work um, with energy efficiency um, and paint, um, if you can believe that, with the um, U.S. Army Construction Engineering Laboratory. Um, I'm sorry, it should say Research Laboratory, Construction Engineering Research Laboratory. Um, we're also going to talk to Dr. Eric Berta from the University of New Hampshire. He's doing a lot of work in nanotechnology. Um, July 12th, we're going to talk to Dr. Kimberly Griswold, who is an engineer who is working on projects that really cross the spectrum of just about every STEM field, from biology to software to physics to material sciences. Um, we do have another um, person who will join that call. Um, we're not quite ready to announce who that is, um, but we're hoping it's going to be someone from another university. Um, and July 25th, we'll speak with... Um, Dr. Ranke, um, who's a toxicologist with the U.S. Army Public Health Center, and then Dr. Orega from um, Temple University, who had been working at Johns Hopkins. I know we have a lot of folks um, who are apprentices at Johns Hopkins at this, on this call today. Um, last year, he was a REAP mentor, and um, this year, he's at Temple University and actually applying some of the material science work that he did at Johns Hopkins to dentistry, which is a really interesting application for that. So what we'd like to do is encourage you to please stay in touch with us. Let us know how your apprenticeship is going. Um, please send stories, pictures. You can tag us on social media. We'd love to see what you're doing, um, how you are learning, um, and who you're meeting through this experience. And as Dr. Munson said, and I'm sure you're going to hear from all of your mentors, is to really use this opportunity to keep learning. You know, the future um, scientific and technology advances are going to happen because of people like you and um, all of us with the AEOP programs, with Dr. Munson, everybody else you're going to hear um, this summer is really rooting for you. We're here to help you and help you get there. So thank you all so much for participating, and we look forward to seeing you at the next session.